Um, one of the greatest of all gaps lies between the natural sciences and the study of humanity. It is the duty of the geographer to build one bridge over an abyss, which in the opinion of many is upsetting the equilibrium of our culture. Employing the symbol of the bridge, now a building block in the grammar of space, in his scope and methods of geography lantern slide lecture at the Royal Geographical Society, and which shortly preceded his appointment in 1887 as the first reader in geography at the University of Oxford, Halford Mackinder conjured up, in a visual and verbal manifesto, a vision of a new geography whose purpose was the resolution of the malaise of modern times. The Royal Geographical Society, referred to henceforth as the RGS, um, has been described by James Ryan um, as the most significant, though the not, not the only, institutional face of geography in Britain throughout the 19th century. Founded in 1830 with the aim of promoting, quote, that most important and entertaining branch of knowledge, ge knowledge geography, by the 1860s, the RGS had gained popularity thanks to its support of African river exploration. And despite sustained attempts to professionalise geographical practice throughout the 1870s, it was not until the 1887 lecture that the Society's ambition of founding a geographical science and gaining an academic foothold was realised. Mackinder thus fulfilled the ambitions of a cohort of reformers at the RGS who, throughout the 1880s, saw in geography the possibility of more than the undertaking of heroic exploration, topographical survey, or the learning of place names by road. But if there was no academic discipline of geography at that time, where, as uh, Brian Bluet, Mackinder's biographer, has asked, did Mackinder's geography come from? In seeking to answer this question, historical geographers, including Bluet himself, have privileged academic centres of learning in discerning the influence of uh, Henry Nottage Mosley, the Professor of Comparative Anatomy on the Oxford Natural Sciences undergraduate course that Mackinder studied, as an important influence. And Bluet also suggests that the RGS, Secretary Henry Walter Bates, an RGS officer and colossus of Victorian experimental science, Francis Galton, may have influenced Mackinder. Um, for others, such as Stoddart, a place for geography had to be chiselled out of ge geology. And meanwhile, others, such as Parker and Kearns, have um, sought the locus of Mackinder's um, uh, success in promoting geography in his martial and imperial instincts. So today, in presenting a short genealogy of science, I will argue that the scope and methods employed by Halford Mackinder um, uh, who went on to become the first reader in geography at Oxford, founded the field of geopolitics, um, and who throughout his career employed the lantern, um, were fashioned by um, the lecturing methodology of the Royal Institute Professor of Natural Philosophy, John Tyndall. And I'm going to argue that this can be discerned uh, in the instruments that he employed, notably that of the lantern and the rhetoric and imagery of what historical geographers um, Gregory Cosgrove and Daniels call geographical imagination um, of these two men. And to date, um, the origin, quality, and scope of Tyndall's influence upon Mackinder um, has been um, unmapped um, and barely articulated. So, um, Founded in 1799, um, as you will probably know, the Royal Institution, um, though a respected scientific organisation that undertook original research within its own on-site laboratories, um, was also amongst the most popular London Savant Societies. Um, Taylor describes it um, as amongst the most prominent organisations to attract the minds and bodies of the professional classes to its formal and fashionable um, Friday evening discourses attended by men and women from 1826 onwards. Um, and the Lantern had featured in Faraday's science demonstrations for adult audiences from circa 1846. Um, however, from 1872 at least, the Lantern became integral to the, um, to the lectures of John Tyndall. And in the same year, 1872-73, um, in an extensive lecture tour of the USA, ooh, Tyndall's use of the Lantern um, described as a camera, in his series of six, six lectures on light, became headline news. 
So within the context of 19th century regimes of truth and imperative scientific methods of evidencing that were complexified as visual evidence supplied by cameras and photographs came to be privileged as much as personal authority, the magic lantern and lantern slide projections came to prominence in lectures across an array of metropolitan entertainment and knowledge-making sites. Yet the Royal Institution's courting of popular audiences via sensational scientific performances led to criticisms. Indeed, Bernard Lightman highlights the prejudices that non-expert audiences of science faced, notably in relation to those participating in our events, described by one critic um, writing for the Saturday Review in 1875 as, quote, scatterbrained auditors. However, as Livingstone, Secord, and Schaffer argue, rather than mere passive auditors, audiences were a powerful force in, shaping, in the shaping of 19th century content, methods, and geographies of knowledge making. Audiences, as Howard boldly states, were the real, quote, co-stars of the scientific performances. And amongst um, the audience of one RI lecture, um, uh, in the 1870s, was one young Halford Mackinder. Mackinder recalled how, um, as a schoolboy, he had written to John Tyndall, stating his desire to hear him lecture and his lack of funds to do so. Um, and here's a quote from Parker, um, drawn from um, fragments um, of an autobiography by Mackinder, um, where Mackinder stated that, in my form, we had been reading his pellucid lectures on heat as a mode of motion. So I wrote to him and explained that I was a schoolboy and short of pocket money, but that he was my hero. By the next post, I received a ticket gratis. I went to the head, got leave for town, and heard Tyndall lecture on fluorescence and saw some wonderful experiments. So the lectures um, on fluorescence... Uh, dealt with the emission of ultraviolet light or non-visual waves that compel substances to emit slow vibrations invisible to the naked eye. Um, and they were a subtopic of Tyndall's six lectures, of six lectures on light, um, specifically in lecture five of that series. And the camera, i.e. the magic lantern, was integral to, that to the performance. And there is an illustration of the magic lantern which features um, in the transcript of the lecture. So presciently, in, that, in the lecture, um, Tyndall asserted that the growth of science is organic. That which today is an end becomes tomorrow means to a remoter end. Every new discovery in science is immediately made the basis of other discoveries or of new methods of investigation. And James Clark Maxwell has supported this um, by des in describing Tyndall as radiating science. And here he is um, personified as a lighthouse. So this encounter with Tyndall, um, which both conforms to um, what my colleague Jane Vess has pointed out to me as the heroic scientist described by Frank Turner, um, and confirms David Livingstone's emphasis upon location and locution, was, in my view, um, as much of a formative influence upon Mackinder's vision of a dynamic and multi-dimensional geography, um, such as that that he promulgated in the Scope and Methods lecture, um, uh, as well as upon his later lecturing and teaching practices with the Lantern. So I want to um, move on now to think about other ways in which we can discern the influence of Tyndall upon um, Mackinder's pra lecturing practices. So the latent influence of Tyndall's practices um, are discernible, to my mind, throughout Mackinder's career. The sources of Mackinder's vision of the new geography, politics, and mutually constituting educational and imperial ambitions of his later philosophy um, can be situated in relation to his early Oxford University Extension teaching practices. Um, the OUE lecture scheme for working class audiences um, extended its syllabus so as to include geography in 1886. And Mackinder, then a recent graduate in double honours in natural sciences and history from Oxford, um, was appointed as lecturer in natural science and economic history. Um, Cosgrove suggests that in the Mechanics Institute lectures that Mackinder um, delivered, he was framing the argument that he would put to the RGS in the 1887 Scope and Methods lecture. Um, and it so happens that um, 
Tyndall um, had connections with the Mechanics Institute as well, um, notably before he went to Germany to study, um, where I think it was in Preston that he he attended lectures and, and drew inspiration from, from the knowledge gained there. Um, sorry, that was a short aside. Um, so it's therefore significant that from as early as February 1886, Mackinder's OUE lectures were at times intended to be accompanied by projections from an oxyhydrogen lantern. And um, the success of his lectures is, sig is signaled by the fact that he traveled um, some estimated 30,000 miles um, around Britain, often by rail, lecturing on the new geography. And um, Gilbert has shown that um, Mackinder gave approximately 102 extent le extension lectures in the year 1887 to 1888 alone, um, and over 600 lectures in all um, across Britain, as you can see from this map. Um, and uh, it's been stated that the missionary zeal with which Mackinder preached the new geography to adult audiences um, is what brought him to the attention of the RGS reformers. So, moving on now to consider um, Mackinder's um, imaginative science of geography. Um, in Tyndall's vision for a science consisting of experimental and imaginative practice, um, I see the probable source for Mackinder's own belief um, in visualization and imagination um, that would allow him to examine the dynamic interaction of human relations and environment in that um, pivotal lecture, Scope and Methods. Um, physics for Tyndall, um, Brock asserts, was no mere branch of education, but the means of education itself. In the 1854 RI lecture um, on the importance of the study of physics as a branch of education, Tyndall um, asserted that regarding also the education of the mind as the improvement and development of mental fa faculties, I shall consider the study of physics as a means towards the attainment of that end. From that point of view, I degrade physics into an implement of culture, and this is my deliberate design. And as such, um, this contests T Tucker's argument that modes of persuasion often drew upon cultural outlooks and prejudices that had little or nothing to do with science itself. Um, McCabe asserts that Tyndall's method of theorizing was distinctive in its em emphasis on the use of imagination as an effective replacement for mathematics and theoretical speculations. And, and this can be seen in the 1870 meeting of the um, British Association for the Advan Advancement of Science lecture um, by Tyndall on the scientific uses of the imagination, in which he urged um, the use of the imagination in science to, quote, dissipate the repugnance and indeed terror, which in many minds are associated with the thought that science has abolished the mystery of man's relation to the universe, but also to overcome objections to Legitim to legitimate um, scientific speculation. So if Mackinder's innovative method of favoring the lantern uh, may have been inspired by Tyndall, uh, then so too can the scope of his imaginative practices. Since um, Mackinder throughout his career um, uh, deemed that all good teaching of geography and history depended upon um, the appeal to visualization. In his um, 1914 teaching manual that you can manual that you can see here, uh, the teaching of geography and history, um, he advocated the cultivation of the mind's eye, um, and that's uh, actually an idiom that was also favoured by Tyndall. Um, he championed, uh, he championed the practice of, of a sympathetic imagination by retaining the childish power of thinking in images. Um, and he also name-checked Tyndall and Faraday in the book, um, rather than perhaps the more obvious Huxley or Mary, Mary Somerville. And McKinder advised that to inspire enthusiasm for her subject, the teacher was advised to make a, quote, special practice of visualization in connection with it. Um, no more devilish means, Mackinder stated, um, of sterilizing young minds was ever invented than the old-fashioned textbook of geography. So um, 
In pursuing the connections between Tyndall and Mackinder, um, we find recurring um, tropes and idioms um, in the writings of both men. Um, geography and topography, Jenkins notes, um, were critical features of Tyndall's scientific imagination. Um, his metaphorical repertoire and the rhetorical output in both his writings about the Alps and in his lectures. Landscapes shaped by the words, images, and idioms they inspired shaped in turn landscapes of knowledge, <coughs> their matter, relationships, relative heights and depths, dimensions and dynamics, in some, the physics of knowledge. And like Tyndall, um, Mackinder ventured into an imaginative realm and um, adopted the trope of the lecturer as pathfinder or guide. Um, and Mackinder also borrowed metaphors from physics, um, understood as, a, as an integrated, multi-scalar um, pra practice. For example, the first and second of our roads, starting directly out of the freest and youngest play, are the twin roads of drawing and modelling. The third and fourth roads are comprised in what is known as nature study. The third follows the flow and the ebb of animal and vegetable life throughout the year, and the fourth follows the circulation of water from sea to sky and back to sea. The fifth is the romantic road of tales from the Wonder Book, tales of distant lands and once upon a time. The sixth road goes with the sun in his apparent path from dawn to dusk and beyond. It leads to the conclusion that the earth is a body hung in space. And these are just some of a few of um, are just a few of the rhetorical tropes and expressions that were common to both men. Um, I had I, it was difficult to decide which ones to talk about today. There were so many. Um, so to um, to sum up, um, I hope that my paper has cast new light on the history of geography um, by exploring the formative influence of the Royal Institution Professor of Natural Philosophy John Tyndall's experimental physics de demonstrations and notionally popular scientific London presentations on the geographical imagination and teaching methods of visualization of Halford Mackinder, um, as well as the professionalization of the discipline of geography. The evidence presented here suggests that epistemological histories need to extend the geographical range of knowledge-making sites beyond academia so as to take in the arc of a character's life and a wider landscape of both physical and imaginary spaces through which they crossed and the knowledge-making practices associated with them um, occurred. The brief e exploration presented here um, queries the once paramount authority of the text um, in favour of that of uh, live multimedia lantern lecture performances. Um, uh, it also uh, perhaps undermines um, the assumed evidence in qualities of images such as photographs that, uh, that also come to prominence in this um, later period of the 19th century. Um, and what we see instead is the intangible and nebulous imagination um, takes the place of, um, of these media. Um, and it has its place amongst um, the matter and material culture of knowledge. In both its methods, um, the use of the lantern and um, its imaginative scope, the academic professionalization of geography and its subsequent propagation to a broader community of teachers and students as much to the physical sciences and to the physics of Tyndall. Mackinder's sourcing of Tyndall's methodology demonstrated through lantern pro projections um, a medium that Mackinder would champion right up to the end of his life over that of moving film is what enabled him to step into the void and to conceive of a new and relativistic ge geography that would um, bridge the earth and nascent human sciences and make visible the dynamic um, um, interaction of topography and human behaviour to audiences um, of all demographics, such as those at the OUE lectures, the RGS and the Oxford University or university authorities. Um, he did this via the projection of maps and images, um, but also by animating these um, with his imagination and the verbal and physical expressions that he projected onto them. Thank you.